welcome to um, the Wellbeing Show. I'm your host, Noel. We've got a great guest on tonight, Martin, who's uh, been a fantastic guest. We ha- were meant to have him on some time ago, and I keep bouncing him, but he's he's bounced back, which I'm really pleased about. Um, so, going to be talking to him very soon um, around an issue that's not discussed enough, as far as I'm concerned, which is around the effects of. Um, problematic gambling and uh, what you can do about that so um, uh, and you know it isn't discussed enough and it, it's very sort of underground but um, uh, first of all I'm just going to sort of remind you that this is a live show so it'd be lovely to have your comments uh, I'm sure James my techie guy uh, will be scanning the airwaves on um, on YouTube and on Facebook Live and see if you drop any comments. But you can also drop comments to me on WhatsApp on 07506 319 745. It'd be really good to um, hear your thoughts and maybe share some of your experiences as well um, around this issue. That's enough from me, I think. Um, so, hi, Martin, welcome. Hi, Noel. Thanks. Thanks for the envy. It's good to have you on. Like I said to you on the phone, um, I just think this is such a massively important issue. And um, I used to do some work setting up groups for um, Crisis at Christmas, which is a homeless charity that puts on shelters over Christmas and the New Year. And I used to work on the street level shelter. So people were literally coming off the streets. And, um, and over the, I think it was 10 years I did that. I was a volunteer at the gate, which was their sort of street level shelter. And there was an exponential rise in the numbers of people who were on the streets because of gambling. And there was the usual people there because of drink and drugs and and, uh, mental health issues. But when I first started, there were none. There was nobody there. Um, By the time I finished at the end of 10 years, I would say a good... 15 to 20 percent of the people who were using that shelter were there because of um, issues around gambling what a gambling had done to them and um, sort of done to their families as well and so um, I saw a huge rise during that period of time um, and you're nodding away there you you're sort of I guess you're nodding in agreement that um, this is what you're experiencing and seeing yourself yeah total, total agreement no one I'm also concerned about the the dual addiction, the, the alcohol and gambling uh, and, and drugs yeah. and gambling. Uh, they seem to go hand in hand quite a lot of the time. Yes. Um, yeah. And more homelessness, more debt, m- more crime, yeah. everything that goes with it and the stigma attached to it, which makes gambling very difficult for someone to put their hand up. It's, it's an interesting one. I agree with you. My, clinically, when I'm dealing with people who have gambling issues, there's a lot of really dark shame around it. Really dark shame. Like, unlike anything I've come across, to be honest. It's sort of something about money and the use of money is so triggering, I think, because money is so much part of our psyche, I guess. Um, and um, I think you, I mean, you have a sort of personal story around this as well, don't you? Uh, in terms of um, the impact of gambling. And I would echo what you're saying about the poly addiction and things running parallel. Um, And, um, you know, uh, so it it was like I grew up um, with, I guess, similar types of generations. I think I'm a bit older than you by the looks of it. You definitely look younger than me, definitely look prettier than me. So there you go. Um, But it was always you were down the pub and down the bookies. That was the same when I grew up. That's where my dad was, and that's where most people's dads were. You know, and that that was the combination. And um, what's your what? I mean, what is your sort of story? Do you mind telling us about it? Sort of. Uh, I'm 62 years of age now. When and when I, I first left school, it was all about wanting to be an adult too quick, and what was available was alcohol, drugs, and gambling. Yeah, and and that's all we knew. I mean, that's what everybody was doing, something in the community along their lines. And without realising that the inequality that we were getting brought up in, and uh, these things all became normal and part of, part of the street, basically, it was alcohol at 16, mm. trying out some drugs, and then, and then gambling was 
sort of the the taboo, the mm. blanked out windows of the bookmakers. And that's where you went in. And, and, and I call it at that time, it was a square go. If I wanted to have a five pound or two pound or whatever it may be on a horse. So football was generally what my draw was and in, in, in a gambling. And then further on down the road, I got married and I had a couple of kids, son and daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, this is in the early 80s and stuff like that and my drinking and my gambling was all part of a man's world it was a man's world it was a young man's world and all these things about being married and having children and all that no now what I didn't know then I wasn't a very good husband and I wasn't a very good father yeah. and, and these are the things that sort of haunt me just now That that's where all my shame and my guilt comes from Right. Um, 2014, my son, 29-year-old Tony, <coughs> took a heart attack mm-hmm. and passed away. And that's when I realised that I wasn't a very good father, I wasn't a very good husband because I was in, I was in the, the midst of a gambling addiction from 2005 with the gambling act came in and they allowed machines into the betting shop. Right. And they... Uh, I get drawn in a free play for a week, the same as everybody else in the shop. These four machines come into the bookies and it, it turned into many casinos mm-hmm. and then enticed in with free play, which is a different mode from real money mode. And we all fell for it. Mm-hmm. And uh, within seconds, you were getting that dopamine hit, which I realised now what it was. But I was getting this dopamine thing, whereas it used to take me four or five minutes for a dog to finish or a horse race yes. or a football match took 90 minutes and, and they were all when it was fun as they say um, it was quite tolerable but once the machines come in I got addicted very quickly and I started getting in on a regular basis and losing all my money hmm. and and what was the free play? I don't know what that is so can you explain free play, free play was competition mode Right. Uh, but, but, but they would have a competition set up, fifty pound to the winner on the Friday, for the locals, the local people who used the bookmakers at the time. But I discovered since then, doing some sort of research, that these machines were designed to give you the near miss, to get you chasing, and it was all happening within seconds. It was roulette by pressing buttons. It's a roulette machine, yeah, and it was so. The crack cocaine or gambling, they were called. Right. And because and because it's not a substance or an alcohol or a drug or whatever it may be, it yeah. was so misunderstood. I didn't understand it myself, no. Mm. I was going I was totally lost why my actions were so irrational and the trouble it got me into financially and then mm. down the road of crime, money lenders and all these kind of horrible things. Now, the point I make about that is um, you don't see the effect it's having on your family, your your friends and, and stuff like that. Because they say every problem gambler <coughs> it affects six to ten others. Yeah. And I can I, I, I can confirm that, that it done so much damage to others without, without realising it. And so your experience was then that this using these machines and the way they were set up and the excitement around them and the buzz it would give you, the neurochemical buzz. People that that don't know, um, dopamine is a neurochemical, um, which is a reward chemical, but it's also, oddly enough, it's a motivator chemical. It's the main chemical that's used in motivation to take action. So um, lack of dopamine is one of the things that happens in dementia, for example. So that's often why people uh, with dementia suddenly stop because they run out of dopamine and they can't move until they restock their dopamine. And there's a the drug people will know about called L-dopa, which is a synthetic form of dopamine, which is a treatment for certain forms of dementia, etc. So dopamine is a, a very important neurochemical and the uh, link between what's called dopamine flooding and dopamine deficiencies are um, there's quite a lot of evidence showing that that may be one of the main features of addiction as opposed to say problematic use of something 
um, because as damage happens to the dopamine receptors, specifically the D2 receptors, um, which mean that people are always chasing that feeling of high because the receptors never measure the correct level of dopamine in the brain. So when people come into recovery, for example, you have to teach them to live with a lower sense of reward and, and just tolerate that. Uh, is that all stuff that you've come across, Martin? That's what you're talking about, yes? Yeah, this is all stuff that I've, uh, I've found out about in recovery. Um, and I feel it's it's something that has to be taught at school. Yeah. I think uh, it's something I, I wasn't aware of as an adult until the last four or five years um, through a partner um, in a community interest company we've set up and I met a chap called Adrian Bailey and they set up a, a website called Beat the Fix, the Machine yeah. Zone and yeah. Gambling Watch Scotland. And, and he's an ex-teacher, he's a lot older than me, and he told me all about dopamine, which fascinated me. I didn't know anything about it. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, I wish I had. I wish I had. In evidence now that there's a strong link between the issues of dopamine and things that move away from problematic use into uh, you, the, the addiction has become wired into the brain mechanisms. Because the, the point about addiction is that it hijacks neurochemical processes. Yeah. yeah, so people don't know this. So, so when you take cocaine, it's hijacking the neurochemical processes linked to having sex, for example, which is often why cocaine is used alongside sex because it produces the same type of neurochemical responses. And and this is true of all addictions. They seems to be that they are hijacking neurochemical. And dopamine is such a fundamental neurochemical. It's like literally the on-off switch in the brain. And so if that's damage, there's real problems going on. Right? And dopamine flooding, it theorised, does damage it. So you were experiencing um, these uh, sort of instantaneous hits of what we would now call dopamine each time you were hitting the button. Is that right? Well, at this particular time, Nola was a taxi driver. Yeah. Um, through, through the worst times of this addiction, for 15, 18 years, I think I was a taxi driver. Right. And I would go out and do a 12-hour shift, and unbelievably, I would get and lose my money on a machine in 10 minutes. Right. Which meant I couldn't go home and tell my wife and kids that with no money tonight again, uh, I, I would go and borrow it. And, 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 and sometimes I would have borrowed it off my son, Tony, who, who would have helped bail me out because he thought he was helping his mother, rather than me even having the audacity to ask him and put him in that position. And I've done the same with my daughter. Just so irrational. And and and, and that's what I mean when I mention I, I take their identity as well. This addiction took the family and yeah. I trapped them as well, as well as being trapped myself, not knowing it. I'd also trapped them. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also... If I'm trying to think back to that when you were active in the addiction as well, in a sense, it's like people, they don't agree with, but they understand if you've got a problem with alcohol or that you've got a problem with heroin, it's known about, isn't it? But the sort of gambling stuff, people just don't know about it. So what was, I mean, like, did you talk at all to your family about what was going on? Or did they just think, who is this idiot that just spats his money away? What happened though was, I, I mean, I, my, my family didn't know I lost it nearly every day because I borrowed and I borrowed to cover up and I okay. covered up and I covered up for years on the financial side of it. Yeah. But when I mentioned I wasn't a good father or parent or, or husband or whatever, I, I, I was there but I wasn't there. Hmm. I wasn't paying the right attention. I wasn't being the right guide. Or, I just, I just wasn't there, basically. That's very much the story that any person with any addiction will say, though. I mean, I, I've heard this story, uh, I mean, I've been in this game 26 years now, and so many patients I've heard, it's the same story. It's interesting. that, um, and, and even for, say, parents who kept their drug use separate or kept their gambling separate, as you say you did, um, there was a sense in which they weren't, emotionally present for their kids and their partners anyway yeah. 
uh, because they were still in their head they were off doing the addiction and it's like it's almost like the family got in the way and you went and did your bit and the, but but really you wanted to be off servicing the addiction you're nodding away is that similar yeah, to you? yeah it's it's uh, it's quite depressing when, when you think back to the state <laughs> i was in and, yeah. and and what i put my family through and and then getting involved with money lenders and stuff like that and also tell me about that I was always covering up, always covering up, covering up, covering up. And then eventually, it's so mentally draining. You, you get to the point that you feel totally worthless, hmm. felt ashamed, guilt, and, and horrible, horrible thoughts. And some of the horrible thoughts, many times you'll hear people in the Gamblers Anonymous rooms talking about suicide because hmm. we feel that that was all that was available. We couldn't turn up at a &E and say that we had a, a gambling problem, the same as we, we'd maybe go with alcohol and get our stomach pumped or, or drugs or whatever. I mean, it, was, right. it, it was so misunderstood. And there were times I'd went to my GP and they couldn't help me either. I went to the hospital or the mental health ward to see if they would let me in because okay, right. I, just, yeah. I didn't want to be here and they couldn't let me in. They couldn't even accommodate me for a night when I was at my worst. So can, can, do you mind telling me, well, I don't want to take you to dark memories, but I think it's useful for people to hear and understand. But So you would turn up to a psych ward and you would say what, and then what would be their response? I, I would speak to anybody who would listen. If I got anybody at the main door, it was usually always locked up and I just begged them to let me stay there for the night. Or I didn't want to sleep in the taxi. I had to change over. I didn't have any any other accommodation apart from going home and have to mm. disclose to my wife again and my kids that I'd lost all my money again. Mm. And, and I, that, that, that feeling... You feel um, like hurting yourself? I tried to avoid that. I tried yeah, you, to avoid... You were, you were feeling like you were going to hurt yourself or you were feeling yeah. so I don't... Yeah, I just felt totally worthless, no. And I, I had these thoughts before about suicide and it might sound strange to a lot of people, but it was very comforting to even think about it. It took me away from the reality, the damage that I was doing and continue to do. Hmm. And I thought that if I would remove myself, this would, this, this, this was the answer. Because I was, as I said, I was attending Gamblers Anonymous and it was a 12-step programme which had already been introduced to through alcohol. Hmm. And I got anxious about even turning up at a Gamblers Anonymous meeting right. because... I would have to declare that I'd had a slip, I'd had a gamble. And it, and I felt as if that I was letting the room down as such and, and it made me feel totally, totally anxious and I didn't want to keep going back to Gamblers Anonymous and saying the same thing. I've mm -hmm. had a slip, I'm, I don't know what to do and there's no other help. There was no other help available. There still isn't very much help available apart from That's Gamblers right. Anonymous. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it doesn't suit everybody, and it doesn't suit women either. That I've discovered over the yeah. last few years that many, many women have got this gambling harm problem, and they find it very hard to go to a gamblers anonymous meeting and stuff like that. And, and that's stuff that we try to highlight in the film. Uh, this, this, this isn't just a young man's problem. This, this can get anybody. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's more available these days because. As you said, the single the gambling act, which made gambling easier, and then introduced um, slot machines, essentially, or what you would call sort of mechanical casinos into betting shops. Yeah. But now, of course, you've got the apps on the phone, um, which are even more readily available in terms of uh, you know uh, the people being able to sort of place quite large bets through their phone on these apps. Exactly, no, and that, and that is a problem. Uh, if I had to bet £100, if I was lucky enough to put it on a horse, that would be limited. They would reduce that stake to maybe £20 yeah. Yeah. because the horse might win. Yeah. Or a football bet, it would be the same. But once you go into the algorithm gambling, which is a roulette machine, mm -hmm. they would take £50,000 off you, £100,000. There's no limits. That's right. yeah. there's, yeah. no, there's no regulation around it. Yeah. There's no affordability checks, nothing like that. Yeah. And, and and that's the difference. With the, the, there's two sides to the gambling. I mean, both do harm. 
don't get me wrong, but there's, there seems to be a bit of regulation regarding what you can lose on a horse or a dog. The the main source of income, 80% of the, the gambling industry income comes from 5% of gamblers who gamble on machines. And in terms of your, I mean, obviously you're not using them now, but the sort of stories that you hear from people, what are there any safeguards on these things at all? Not on the not not on the roulette. Not once you go online, and people have anybody's listening, they'll know they'll realise if they watch any football or anything on TV, the bombardment of gambling advertised. Yeah, yeah. It, and it's saturation. It's it's all through sport now as well. The exact same way as tobacco was, and that was removed in a public to a public health space. And the and the tobacco industry screamed. Sport would never survive without their money. Yeah. And all the mistruths they told us about safety, about tobacco and alcohol, mm. these are all things that are coming to light now. And we feel that the gambling industry is getting shown up for the bad regulation, the lack of regulation around online. Mm. And it's global, no, this isn't just a UK thing. Mm. I mean, I raise awareness and campaign with people from Finland, America and Australia, which are all badly... And, and need of help as well regarding mm-hmm. regulation. So just to be clear, the sort of harms and difficulties that you were experiencing were psychological and mental health ones and your yeah. perception of yourself to the point where you felt suicidal, you tried to get yourself admitted into hospital, the dishonest, lying, cheating relationships with your family, um, the fact that you got involved in loan sharks and some criminality, I guess, to try and sort of pay off your debt so that you're moving more and more into the criminal underworld, as it were. And and it's not a desire of yours. You weren't, you didn't set out to be a robber. That wasn't your plan, right? But, but you're more and more drawn into these things because you needed somehow to get the money to fix the habit. And then the lack of... Um, positive response or any of the helping professionals that you did turn to because nobody understood it. Nobody really got that, that it was a genuine problem that you had. Um, and I guess people's perception when you did talk to them about it was something along the lines of, well, you can just stop, can't you? just don't bet. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the problem, as I said, because it's not an actual substance. It's it's misunderstood because it's, it's seen as greed. Basically, people see it as a greed thing and it's all about money, and and, uh, and I did think that at the beginning as well. And I mean, I, I mean, I lose if I if I lost a day's takings, it would probably been uh, around eighty pound. Now eighty pound is is not a lot of money to a lot of people, but eighty pound is a lot of money to somebody if it's your last eighty pound. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and that and that's the way it was on a daily basis for years and fifteen years probably. And, and try to hide it and then and then owning up to it and maybe getting six months free from Gamblers Anonymous, which put us on a good, not a good, but a, a stable financial situation because I had a wonderful wife who stood by me through all these times and we had to remortgage the house. She had to go bankrupt because I was bankrupt and the, the ripple effect it all causes so many problems that probably aren't highlighted as much. So let's talk a bit more about how you got into your recovery and how you stabilised. So th- what was available was Gamblers Anonymous, and it works for some people, it doesn't work for others. Um, but you tried that, and it was it was giving you a bit of clean time, but then not working, and then you were relapsing. Is that the story? How long did that go on for, Martin? Years. Years, no, when the, the light bulb moment, the call it is, the day that we got the phone call to come home, we were, we were on our family holiday and my son never came on this holiday and uh, we, had to, we had to come home. He was, in, he was in a bad way. We were in Florida and it took us a day to go home and, and that day was probably the longest day in all our lives. And... And your thought process is, is, is 100 miles an hour and you're worried about your family. You're, I'm worried about my wife and because it's, it's, a horrible, it's a horrible thing for a mum, parents, 
sisters. It's just horrible, and it's very hard to describe, but I believe that was my light bulb moment, my trauma that made me realise I could never play for another bet. I could never. And, and my son's memory is what made me start raising awareness. Okay. Start, start doing something that maybe help people, then not to make them understand, but to let them be aware that this is a, a horrible, horrible addiction. And so I guess what changed? I mean, I'm very sorry about your son. It's awful, and he died of a heart attack, right? Yeah, um, and uh, and that sort of pushed you into wanting to change and the decision you made about change was to help other people is that right and to sort of try and raise awareness well just i mean i mean it just didn't happen as quick as that no i mean there was a grieving process and mm. uh, and that kind of thing and then i didn't want to work i didn't want to be go into the public taxi arena anymore and and sure. i became i had to think of something to to bring any in income i mean after the it sort of died down a wee bit sort of thing and yeah. we had to get things back on. So me and some of Tony's friends decided that we would start up a, a small garden company. Okay. Um, and and that has progressed from 2015 till now. Which, and I work with all of Tony's friends, so I'm reminded of them practically every day, which, right. which is good. Um, yeah, that's where I'm off I'm interested. Why did you choose a gardening company? Because I, I always felt that people would come round and chop your door and cut your grass and wouldn't come back again throughout the years. Mm. And uh, I've always been a bit of a keen gardener myself. It was always a great place to go out and escape and mm. get some fresh air and maybe clear ahead a wee bit. And uh, cutting grass and all that, and not dealing with the public as much. It was, uh, it was quite... It's quite easy. Not. It's interesting because there's a there's a thing called biophilia, which I don't know if you know about, but it's a specific psychological effect we have when we're involved in nature and gardens and parks, um, and uh, it's very healthy for us. It makes us feel connected. It's, there's a really part of it is a, like if you build a park in a city, around that park, violent crime will drop by about twenty percent because of this biophilic mm -hmm. effect. It's it's odd, isn't it? It's really strange. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I guess also, uh, you sound Scottish to me. I'm assuming you're Scottish. Yeah, Scottish. Just outside Glasgow, no. Uh, and and Scotland and nature go together in my head because yeah. I live in Edinburgh. And the, some of the most beautiful world places in the world, I think, are in Scotland. Scotland and Norway compete, in my mind, for the most beautiful places on the planet. Um, and so I guess you knew about nature and you had that connection. And I'm intrigued because... Uh, intuitively, I understand why you would be drawn to nature and to gardening after something as horrific as your son dying at such a young age. Because, you know, no parent expects to outlive their kids, do they? I mean, it's just not, it's not what you expect in life. I mean, my son's turning 12 in a couple of weeks' time, and I, I definitely do want to die before him. I don't want to die, but, you know, I definitely want to go before. I don't, I don't want to live in a world where he's died. And I carry on. I don't know how you do that. I, I've sort of really, I don't know how you managed it, mate. <laughs> yeah, no, I've got a grandson who's 12 as well. Right, okay, yeah. And I keep telling him, don't grow up, stay 12. <laughs> I'd, I'd love him to stay 12. Yes. I keep telling him it's a trap. Don't yeah. you know what I mean? I keep saying this is a trap. It's a scam. All kidding aside, <laughs> all kidding aside, no, I really, I really worry for the for the younger ones coming through yeah. this this existence and now with the online safety bill and all the kind of things that's happening online. Yeah. Um, white papers have been dropped by the government on the safety bill and the gambling regulation bill, and we don't know where we're going to now, government wise. I, so I think they. Um, I think this government are, are intent on committing suicide, so I'm not quite sure how long they're going to be around. <laughs> it's, it's like, I think it's, I mean, I, it is ridiculous what's going on at the moment, but I literally think they've, they've, they've got the rope, they've tied a noose, they put it around their necks, and they're insisting on jumping off. It's not quite breaking their necks, but they're going to do it again. So I think all this stuff will come back. I, I genuinely do, because I think they're, they're so... 
so there's something so weird about these people that are in power at the moment that, that I just don't think they can stay. Coming back to this and thinking about um, this horrific incident, but somehow you go through the grooming process, and, and but it, it requires you to rethink what you're doing, is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah? Yeah. You have to have a radical change, and this is how you, you did it, right? What was the next step after the business with your son's friends? Um, were you sober? In fact, the comments during this time, or were you still gambling? What what was going on? No, no, I wasn't gambling. All no, I was, a, I was in a bit of yeah, an abyss. Um, what was just a daily slog, but there was something missing, and and it was something to do with my recovery. I had to, I had to find out more why, why my mind worked like that. Yes. Because I, as I said, I didn't know about dopamine and stuff like that. I didn't know until. I met my friend in 2015, who's an ex-teacher, ex-lecturer, and he's from Liverpool. Yeah. And he and he and and we seem to click because I I met him through another friend and I asked him, I wanted to write a book now. And I, I'm not That's educated. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not educated, and I soon realized I wasn't capable of writing a book. I didn't even know what a blurb was or a synopsis or, oh. or anything about writing. I just had this crazy thought that I could write a book and I soon realised I couldn't but my friend could and uh, we sort of built up a, a relationship and we wrote well he wrote a book and I'd talked I'd talk to him about gambling and this friend also has mental health problems and uh, alcoholic problems in the past as well yeah. and very academic so looking back it gave me a bit of light that this just doesn't happen to thick people like me. This happens to clever people as well. Yeah, yeah. You're not thick if you just because you don't have an education. I'm going to find that corner. If you're not academic or school intelligent, that's that's just a set of skills you don't have or a set of knowledge you don't have. It doesn't mean you're stupid at all. Um, and I think actually our education system is geared towards academia far too much. When you and I were growing up, you would have technical schools and technical colleges, and and that was good. You would learn a trade and a skill. Nobody was stupid yeah. about doing that stuff, you know. Um, so, um, so I, I'm just going to challenge your language there. You're not thick at all. Um, but you, this ex teacher of yours who became a friend, that gave you an insight into this stuff. Um, is an equal opportunities destroyer of lives. It's sort of like, it doesn't matter where you come from, if you've got it, whether it's alcohol addiction or, or game, gambling addiction or uh, another substance, etc., it, it, it will just cut you down, right? Well, what, what I jumped on, you know, and the great relief was that Adrian made me realise that, that this wasn't all my own fault. Yeah, I take I take responsibility for for my yeah. actions and stuff like that. But I also felt that these other industries had to take some sort of responsibility with alcohol and, and especially the gambling regulation. As we can see, it's all over the place now, yeah. and kids have realised now that sometimes parents will ask me to go and speak to a fourteen year old kid who's a gamer, and he's getting just into this dopamine thing through. Yeah loot boxes, FIFA packs, and I've been in a 14-year-old's bedroom and seen it smashed up with anger because they're not realising what's happening to them either. Parents aren't realising what, what's happening to them either because mm. I've seen parents say, maybe go on your games for half an hour, geese piece, go and play with your laptop or whatever, and not realising the dangers that's on online. And just touching on something all about online, I was at a funeral last Friday, Mm -hmm. A work colleague, his 14 year old son took a TikTok challenge. Uh, yeah, he lost, he really? lost his life. Yeah, uh, um, uh, is that ligature stuff that yeah. the kids are doing? It's just horrific. I mean, it's like, um, it really should be shut down if it's allowing things video. Yeah, I can't, you can't know what believe I mean? it's like, been allowed. Uh, it really, yeah, I'm shocked by it. It's, it's awful. It's awful. I'm sorry about your friend's loss, that's dreadful. Absolutely yeah. awful thing. Um, there is, I mean, there's obviously there's uh, various ways in which these dopamine hits can happen. I'm going to keep us on the 
your story, if that's all right, because I think it's really important. Um, so you, what was the book you wanted to write and did you write it? I did. Uh, we, we, we wrote quite a big read, a book called Scotched, S-C-O-T-C-H-E-D, okay. and another short story book called um, The Big Wheel. Yeah. Predictions. James will be looking for them at the moment. Are they available online? Yeah. So James will be looking for them, he'll post them out, as well as the other websites they said. So yeah. you don't need to worry about searching for it. It'll just be in the links. Yeah, and, and that was part of the part of the recovery, I call it, and, and I got more into recovery and other ways to think, different ways to think and stuff like that. So there was uh, something about you got into healthier work. Um, you had a shock that made you reevaluate things. You got into healthier work. You then decided you wanted to tell the story. You learned new skills, writing a book. I mean, that's quite, that's a really impressive thing to do, Martin. I wouldn't write a book, that's hard work. Um, and for somebody who doesn't come from um, a good, strong school background, that's even harder. Yeah. That's really yeah. courageous stuff. Um, but you write a story in Scotch, I guess, which was about you and your sort of experience and the transformations that yeah. you yeah yeah about, about my son my son this was another fancy word I learned protagonist <laughs> he, he was the main sort of character that we tried to put through the film as being a hero I, as I said no I class myself as a McDonald's dad I'd run him through the drive through for 10 minutes and think I was the greatest father on earth and doing this book yeah, he would have thought that as well my boy thinks I'm the best thing since sliced bread if I take to McDonald's I'm yeah. telling you it's a quick win with any kid yeah. <laughs> that, that was a, uh, that's what I was known as the McDonald's dad <laughs> that, uh, that's what my boy would like me to be so I was just thinking I'm sure your kid liked it <laughs> and, and, but, but that was that was that didn't happen too often either. No, do you know what I mean? Because I couldn't even afford a McDonald's at the time, oh. and if I did be lucky enough to have any winnings or anything like, that, they they weren't shared. Hmm. I mean, I, I couldn't even buy them a fish supper, knowing that the questions would be asked, why would I have money and all this kind of thing. So it's uh, it's you, just a, hor it's a horrible existence. And you get this book turned into a film. Is that right? Is that what happened? Well, what progressed from that was no like this speaking about gambling I always felt it would be easier to show somebody rather than tell them yeah right yeah yeah and somebody wrote me a poem about being a taxi driver and suicidal thoughts and stuff like that and it was called one last spin and I knew that that was the name of the film that we had in mind for a year or two before mm -hmm. we actually started filming and getting funding and getting people because the film industry was a different world for me, meeting directors and producers and all these kind of people. So I joined an amateur film thing in Glasgow. Nice. It gave me a bit of an insight to how it all worked. Yeah. And uh, I realised that these people done it for the love of what they were doing rather than financial benefits, and which, which didn't Happen a lot in my life because I was always what was in it for me, what was in this for me. That was my attitude. What am I getting out of this? And uh, these these guys showed me a different way and how to love doing what they were doing and getting behind the scenes of this film and all that was absolutely brilliant for me. And and, and since all that's happened, no, I'd rather class myself as in discovery rather than recovery. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get because that. Because I've discovered so much about capitalism for, for wanting a better world and, and how we're all being manipulated in, in, in the communities that I grew up in. We know no resources for any any assistance getting in the university or college or whatever. The, the last time I looked at some of the stats regarding people leaving school, some of them couldn't even read or write. Uh, mm -hmm. After 10 years at school, I think it was very high, the numbers who came out illiterate. Mm -hmm. And now I've discovered digital literacy as well. It's, it's causing a lot of problems for people in my generation. Mm -hmm. I'm not technical gifted. I, I'm hopeless, in fact, but I can imagine the troubles that a lot of people would have 
on bingo sites, on gambling sites, and middle age, older ladies, people with mental health problems. They, they, these are all people who are vulnerable to to gambling or, 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 or addiction in general. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you you get the film done. What's the film about? Tell us about the film. Well, one last bit. The film, the film's based on um, four lived experience stories, myself and three others, Tony Franklin, Kelly Field, and John Myers. Mm-hmm. Now, John Myers is a, is a, is, they're all friends now through the film, but John Myers' his son committed suicide due to gambling, mm-hmm. and John wanted to tell his story. He wanted to let people know that this is what it does to to, to people who become totally harmed by gambling. They don't see a way out. And very difficult for young men, especially, to put their hand up and speak and and ask for help. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when had, people get uh, hold of this uh, film, is it available to watch? The film, the film is actually doing a film festival just now, no, okay. which is part of the director's deal. But he get he get entered into film festivals, yeah. And after a year, we we'll, we we'll, we'll acquired some funding and we're going to set up a professional website. And right. one last spin will be available on YouTube and and Good. our own channel. Wait, I mean, let me know. I'll make sure people know about it because they, it, it's so important. But it, it's just like what a story so far. You know, you're going from trying to get yourself admitted into a psych ward because you can't stand life anymore, to learning how to make films, discovering the joy of creativity and and um, sort of altruism and altruistic acts. I mean, th- that that is quite an extraordinary shift, really. Thanks. Going on Thanks. Your- um, just life is just the way it is sometimes. You know, we've just got to accept and try and deal with, with, with better knowledge, I feel, yeah, with yeah, how I, to move on. I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass. What I'm suggesting to people who might be listening to this, who may be at the, I want to get into a psych ward or I want to kill myself stage, is I want them to listen to this bit of the story. That yeah, yeah. no matter how dark it's been, it can transform, life can transform, with work and with time and with effort and making the right decisions. And that's why I keep coming back to, well, what were, what were the things that you did on your journey? Because that might be useful for people to hear. So you you learn, sort of, you decide to get a new job, which is incidentally a very healthy job. It's outdoors, it's working with nature, it's all that sort of stuff. And it, it allows you to heal, reconnect and and uh, you're working with your son's friends and and so that's really healing and positive helps you through the grief and then you because you're healing and you're sort of not using and destroying that healing you're sober um, it then makes you think well I, I I want to grow now I feel like I need to grow that's what it sounds like to me and you start growing and you and you want to write something about the experiences and then you want to turn it into a film and then you want to help people. And these are all sort of natural human processes because we we are we are always at our best when we're in groups, when we're in the herd, right? And we're doing something for the herd and we're putting back in the world. That's those are psychological facts, okay. That when we're helping others. But it's wonderful to hear you say this. So you then do the film and creativity, and we know that there's a link between healing from trauma and doing creative acts. We know that's a link and because creativity is the opposite of trauma, psychologically, literally. Um, what was the next set? You said you set up an organisation and a website and a help group. And, and sort of when did that come about and, and how did that come about? It came about um, a, couple of, a couple of years, just before the pandemic. Yeah. We had sorted out um, some ideas regarding the film. It was meant to be a three-minute, advert as such to de-glamorise gambling because it was so glamorised on TV it is, yeah. and, and, and people like me knew that that was yeah, no, exactly exactly you know it's, it's just it's bullshit I mean the, yeah, the yeah. trick of gambling is it's horrific right and, and speaking to other people many of us decided that 
we would rather have been a heroin addict rather than a gambling addict. But to take us on to the film, as I said earlier, we've got to show that because I wasn't educated, people would do this and, and do that. And I needed somebody to show me how to do things. No, I, I needed showed how to do a lot of things. I needed told how to think, basically, because as I said to you, I never got much education. I'd never heard the dopamine in all my life until four or five years ago, which mm -hmm. is, which if I'd have found out about, if, I've seen butts and all, I don't usually do that, but if I'd have found out maybe through some sort of, maybe in Gamblers Anonymous or whatever it may be that spoke about this mind-boggling thing, because there's a certain section of people... <laughs> It's unequivocal. If you educate people on their risks, they don't take the risks as much. It's, that's just yeah. unequivocal. So we know that with young people and drugs. And the reason why we've got drop off in the use of alcohol and tobacco, etc., and now more and more around drugs is because we're giving people the education. We're treating people like intelligent beings. We're saying, this is what happens if you do this. Is that what you really want to do? And of course, the industries that produce these damaging substances don't want that information to go out. I mean, that's the truth, right? Yeah. So. And discovering the arts as well. No, as I said, Glasgow Film Crew, university chaps and stuff like that, and ageing being sort of academic. It fascinated me. I met one of the finest Scottish actors well, who's made a right good few films, David Heyman, yeah. and he encouraged me to carry on writing some of the stuff that I had written Good. for theatre and stuff like that, theatre pieces. And I'd never been into a theatre in my life. And I've been in Berlin prisons, been to prisoners, and and, and that's that's my buzz, yeah. basically. That's when I see somebody saying, oh, I, or speaking to somebody and they say, oh, my friend's a gambler, or my friend went through this. And it, that's not encouraging that there's, there's people who, who are suffering, but it's encouraging that there is progress, there is work to be yeah, done. Yeah. So you've created a sort of tribe around you as well, a support group of fellow travellers, et cetera, that you're there. I presume they help you with your projects, but also they're available for you to talk to if you're feeling yeah. low and lost and all of that sort of stuff. Now, the reason why I'm labouring these points is because I, I think it's really important for people to understand that these processes that you've been involved with are well known. And this is how you get into being healthy and wealthy in life, emotionally wealthy and psychologically wealthy. Um, and then other financial wealth actually generally tends to follow because uh, if you can be part of groups and you can be creative and thoughtful and problem solving, you're generally better off in, you, you're better in the workplace, to be honest, often. But um, now what's interesting, I mean, we talked about this and, um, and I wouldn't mind if we talked about it a little bit, is that, um, although you went to GA and Gamblers Anonymous, ultimately that didn't work for you. Um, yeah, but yeah. still you got your discovery, as you call it, um, and um, your growth in your life, whatever words people want to use. And you're clean from the using, et cetera, et cetera. So it's working for you, the choices that you've made. Um, do you mind, I mean, can we talk a little bit about why GA didn't work for you? I don't want to attack the organisation. No, no, I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say it doesn't work, no, I would say it didn't work for me. No, that's why I said, why didn't it work for you? Not because, and then what, And so we can understand that. And again, I say this not because... Um, I want to attack the organisation. I'm in 12-step recovery myself, as you know, and it really works for me, and I'm very grateful for that. But I know, absolutely, 12-step does not work for everybody. And But there is a there is a myth around people in 12-step. They say, it does work for everybody. Is it just if you work harder at it, it'll be... It's not true. It works for some people, and those of us it works for... I am one of them and I'm profoundly grateful for it, but it doesn't work for everybody. And I think it's really important to hear why it does not work and then hear a story of hope about what you can do if it doesn't. Because clearly your evidence that you can move beyond that framing and still find a happy and healthy life, right? That's yeah. that's the conversation I want to have, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, to be fair to Gambles Anonymous, it saved my life two or three times. I would say, no, I, I, I had nowhere else to go. As I said, when, when psychiatric words tell you to 
you can't come in the night, try another night or whatever it may be. Gambles yeah. Anonymous was the only place I went. And certain groups were certain certain people um I got on greatly and, and they told a great story and but I left a GA meeting and still felt that urge to gamble. I still felt yeah. I wasn't getting anywhere and that was down to I wasn't getting it or, or whatever it may be. I wasn't too sure. But I can assure you it did save my life many, many times and great yeah. people. Yeah. Great, great <laughs> people. And then and then and again, we're off started right? mentioning God. Yeah. God started no, getting like mentioned heavy. a bit more and I'm not a big God believer, if honest with you know, especially since tragedies have happened. And when you look at the state of the world, God was the last thing I wanted to hear. And I was brought up Roman Catholic, um, Irish parents and stuff like that. And it was a big whammy. It was that was me discovering that it was like Santa Claus. Right. <clears throat> that <clears throat> that's the way. Um, it's hard to describe, but and as I said, when I did gamble and I did mention it, I gambled an anonymous meeting. I felt as if they were shooting the wounded sometimes. The sigh, the, the, the oh, again, you would hear the, the things and that. And as I said, I probably still would have been, hopefully, I'd have still been in attending Gamblers Anonymous, whatever it may be. But as I said, I feel the tragedy is the thing that's put me yeah. that I, I mean I know that I won't gamble again I know that um, but I don't say it too often I just I, I still do the day to day programme yeah, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow but I, I know I won't gamble tomorrow Yeah, and, and I know the, I won't gamble next week the reason why I ask you to talk about it is not again it's not to say something's wrong it's just to say because I know for a fact that um, these programs work very well for the people they work well for, but they don't work for a lot of people. And, and yet it's really important to say to those people, well, okay, that's fine. There are other things you can do which will work for you. Yes. Yeah. And it's just about always, I think, giving a message of hope, not attacking. Great, that works for you. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me, not because I'm not trying hard enough, which is often what people say. Oh, you're not trying hard enough. You're not. And, and there is a lot of people will talk about the problems they have around spirituality and God and stuff like that, which exists. I mean, I, I, I'm an atheist. And the way I got through it was by setting up atheist groups in London. Right. Um, and I'm well known as an atheist in my local group. So people shut the fuck up and they don't talk to me about it, right? Because <laughs> they know what they're going to get from me. So they don't bother. And they got to know me as a person. But not everybody's like me. Do you know what I mean? Not everybody's says pig headed as me and as up for a fight in the way that I am. You can tell I'm up for a fight, right? And so give me a fight and I'll go for it. Not everybody's like that. And they're not always going to set up their own groups with their own groups of people, right? Um, but I think it's really important to say to people that recovery from this really awful stuff, gambling, can happen, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's about keeping at it, you know. And I think the principles of recovery are this, that, you, first of all, you just have to somehow find a way of stopping because <laughs> yeah. if you keep using, it's going to do your head in. Um, and... At the same time, you then want to get a healthy lifestyle together and you want to get some people around you, you want to get some projects in your life, get some creativity in your life and get some love, get some altruism, get some meaning and purpose and these things. And that's literally what you've done, right? Yeah. That is what you've done. That's the package and that's available for other people as well. What was the website you mentioned sort of about a third of the way in the show? Yeah. We've, we've got three websites. No, right. uh, Gambling Watch Scotland. Gambling, say that again. Gambling Watch Scotland. Gambling Watch Scotland. Is that all one word? Gambling, Gambling Watch, Watch Scotland. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one uh, word? Machine Zone. Machines on. Machine Zone. Machine Zone. Zone. Yeah. Machine Zone. Z. Yeah. Okay. There you go. And one last spin. One last spin. Okay, James, I hope you've found all of those 
And what's available on those websites for people? What can they find? Information, they're, uh, they're packed with information for help, um, where you can go, creative groups and stuff that we're doing, stuff that we're highlighting. And the Scottish Alliance, the government, have been made more aware of it. I'm also involved in a campaign called Gambling with Lives, and that's families who have lost sons and daughters to gambling, to suicide. Yeah. And I campaign down in Westminster quite a lot with them. Yeah. And I be another group called The Big Step. Yeah. Who concentrate on the football advertising sponsorship and sport. It has to stop, doesn't it, that stuff? We have yeah. to stop it. It's definitely got to be taken away from sport, no, yeah. because it's so normalised. And last year, the industry spent $1.5 billion on adverts. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's pretty excruciating. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, I mean, I'm blown away by you, Martin, I have to say, because um, as a reformed addict myself, I mean, I know how dark it gets. Um, and I haven't even done a fraction of the sort of stuff that you've done. So, um, you know, my hat's going off to you. Really extraordinary transformation of your life. And you continue to make it possible for other people to have a similar transformation themselves. Um, yeah. and, and it's directly saving lives, what you're doing, without a doubt. It's directly saving lives and the ability to work on all levels of society. Um, and, and it's profoundly impressive and moving um, sort of to hear your story. Um, we are going to have to finish there. Are there any other resources that you want people to know about before we move on, before we end of the show, that you think people should know about, like websites or services that you think are useful um, that we can put out and go alongside the show? As I said, the, the first protocol I would say, and anybody know, was to Gamblers Anonymous. Right. If anybody's struggling with this addiction, go to Gamblers Anonymous, pick up the phone, speak to somebody. You don't have to wait till you're caught. You don't have to keep digging. It doesn't have to be loads of money. It doesn't have to be just if you feel as if there's a problem developing or you're just going through the same cycle and losing your salary every month, which hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people are doing. Seek help. Speak to somebody. And and I'm sure once you speak to somebody, if you're keeping this all in, this cleansing is, is, is amazing. And yeah. once... The first day of recovery, discovery, whatever you want to call it, is for you. And I always say that's why we've got different fingerprints. We're all different. And uh, I mean, gardening might suit me and raising awareness about gambling might suit you. Yeah. It, it's what we find, but it's finding, it's finding something, it's a walk. It might be a bit of fresh air. And people might be under the constraints of work. And, and, and I'm lucky that way that I've got a bit of spare time now. I'm sort of semi-retired, and that gives me time to raise awareness, and, I, and that's what I'm all about. You don't sound retired at all. You sound incredibly busy to me. <laughs> so I'm sort of yeah. not quite sure what that version of retirement is, actually, but non-stop. Yeah. Um, look, um, stay there for a second, Martin. We're going to end the show. It's just brilliant. It's been brilliant to have you on. Um, and we look at bringing you back as well. And I'm pondering having another guest on with you who runs a charity helping families bereaved um, from addiction issues. And so we'll see if we can get that hook up because I think that side of things is really important given your story as well. Um, well, I think, no, I think you may have had Charles and Liz from Gambling with Flies lined up um, previously. I'm not too sure if, if that's correct, but they, they, they run a great charity as well for bereaved parents and stuff. Who, Charles and? Charles and Liz from Gambling With Lives, which is a charity set up by bereaved parents. I, I don't know them. I'd like to meet them, definitely, and bring them on. Um, yeah. No, I was thinking of somebody else, but actually, great. The more, the better, I think, to be honest. It, it's really good. So you hang around, and after the show, I'll, I'll get some contact details from you uh, about them. Um, and um, uh, just stay there for a minute as I say goodbye to everybody. So um, amazing to have... Martin with us this evening, really, uh, it, it's such an important issue, but I do want to get a message across to people that, um, you know, as Martin said, you, you know, you don't have to wait until 
you've been smashed to bits by this thing. You can start, you can get it earlier. So my advice always is to people, like I think of it like this, that if you've got like the beginnings of concerns about things, there's, there's no harm in going to people who know a bit more about it and just checking out your concerns. And they may be able to point you, and we know this from the evidence of harm minimization, that actually if you get things early on, you, you may not need the full-blown addiction treatment. You just may need something slightly healthier, a healthier way of dealing with stuff. And, and the earlier you get this stuff, the better, always, always. So uh, don't wait until... Uh, Martin and I did until we're old men and broke into pits by the stuff. Really don't do that. Get it younger and just learn healthier habits around this stuff. Uh, we're going to finish that for now. And I'll see you all uh, not next week. Next week, I won't be here. We'll have a, another show on. Uh, but I'll be back the following week. And I can't remember who I've got on, but that's far too far in advance for me to ever possibly remember anything. Uh, but it's been lovely to have you all. I'm going to say goodbye for now. You stay there, Martin. And I'll see you all in a couple of weeks' time.